Good afternoon, everybody. This is Stanley Okoro. Um, welcome to the number 11th AMPA webinar. Um, today, we are going to be talking about the Tax Master's last minute green light savings opportunity and strategy. Um, hosting this 11th webinar with me today is Susan Edionier, um, an ENT physician in Houston, Texas. Susan, are you there? Yes. I'm awesome. here. Good morning, everybody. All right. Um, just, just as a protocol, we always have a national president kind of talk about um, AMPA, what AMPA stands for. And just to kick it off, uh, introducing our uh, AMPA national president, Dr. Christopher Okunsuri. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stanley Okoro. And once again, I want to appreciate everybody on this call, but especially the panelists who have taken time out of their busy schedule to share their knowledge with us. Um, AMPA has been in existence back in 1995. We are a 501c3 organization, and we represent over 5,000 Nigerian dentists and physicians in this country. And we are pretty much um, happy to continue to see this opportunity as a value for our membership. And we honestly appreciate the whole idea that this is part of our professional development, is part of an opportunity for us to gain insight into leadership. It's also an opportunity for us to, you know, acknowledge the need for practice referrals, but most especially, I think there's a huge opportunity and advantage for networking here, either within AMPA or outside AMPA from experts like you who will be presenting today. And pretty much it, continues to enhance all the ideas that we support, which is medical mission and volunteerism and support in times of need and joy amongst our members. So without spending too much time, I would again thank the panelists and open this back to new host, Dr. Adiowe and Dr. Okoro, so that uh, we can uh, take on this um, conference call at this point. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Okunsuri. Susan. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Dionway, and I am the membership chair for the National uh, AMPA uh, body. And I just wanted to, again, um, extend a, a warm thank you to all of our uh, panelists and attendees today. And I really want to take this time to just encourage everybody to be sure you're staying connected with AMPA. As you can see, um, as we continue to grow, as uh, Dr. Kunsere said, we're adding a lot of benefits and we wanna be sure you're connected with us so you are aware. So how are the different ways you can stay connected with AMPA? First of all, we have a very strong social media platforms. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at AMPA underscore national. You can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, also, we do uh, utilize email quite regularly and very heavily. So please be sure that you are um, in connection with AMPA. There are emails that come through our e-groups where uh, that's more of a, a platform for discussion, but you will see communications from AMPA nationals. Be sure again that you uh, make sure you receive these communications to your inbox. Some people may find them going to their promotional folders, et cetera, but please look out for them. Uh, you can also follow our website. Uh, our website is undergoing some changes, which will be launching shortly. But one of the things you will be able to have and see and have access to is a calendar of our events. So you will always know what AMPA is up to next. And most importantly, stay connected with your local chapters. You can find the local chapters on our website as well, which is www.ampa.org. Uh, but you can also contact us if you need help finding your local chapter at membership at ampa.org. Thank you, guys. Thank you. In terms of um, the, a lot of people are asking about the webinar. The webinar is going to be hosted um, the first Saturday of every month. So it's going to be at 12 noon. We're going to keep it for just one hour, just to respect your time. Just know that this is an intentional aggregation of subject matter experts all across uh, anything financial. Uh, we promise this will be the highest and best use of your time on Saturday morning. Uh, of course, it will always be re recorded for uh, later viewing. This is a, a, a free membership to AMPA members, so please share and uh, use the opportunity to thank all of our panelists for their time. 
Um, this is something that we would ordinarily would be paying for, and they're, they're sharing their, their time with us, so please share, share with them. Um, the materials presented at all AMPA webinar is for general educational information purposes only and is solely the opinion of the presenter. No webinar is intended to provide personalized financial or legal advice. It is left to the discretion and judgment and is the sole responsibility of each attendee to determine what is necessary for his or her own practice. Neither the speakers or AMPA can be held responsible for the materials, opinion, or inadvertent error or omission in the preparation or presentation of the material. Furthermore, nothing in the material should be construed as an endorsement by AMPA. Today, we are talking about the tax master's last minute green light, uh, savings opportunities and strategy. I'm gonna have Amy Kanu, who is well known to AMPA members. Um, he's the founder and CEO of Wealth RX for Doctors. He will introduce the panelists today. Um, Amy? Yes, Stanley. Thank you, you very much. Read this disclaimer. <laughs> Please, go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, that's you. Go ahead, Amy. Well, thank you again, and welcome to another month of financial briefings, financial intelligence for you doctors. Um, it is always, hopefully, our intent here to provide you advice that you can actually act on and intelligence that is meaningful in your lives. So thank you for taking your time. And as Stanley rightfully put it, our objective is to make this the highest and best use of one hour that you commit to this the first Saturday of every month at noon Eastern time. You can adjust for your own time zones. Today we're talking about last minute tax planning strategies and so on. Stanley, go on to the next slide, please. Uh, as you know, Stanley also talked about this what we bring from a differentiation standpoint is expertise aggregation, an aggregation of multidisciplinary experts, subject matter, thought leaders, and the best in our industry. What happens a lot of times is people don't fully understand that just like you have specialties in medicine, there are different specialties when it comes to financial affairs and financial matters. There's estate planning. You need attorneys and things like that. We have uh, a very fine estate planning attorney and a number of them, actually. One of them is uh, also on this call, Owe is on this call. And um, you know he'll be on our Ask the Experts panel next month in January. Tax planning. Well, today is about last minute tax planning, my friends. Insurance planning. Insurance is our subject matter in February. And so understanding this particularly misunderstood asset class is what we hope to unpack for you in February. Income planning. We'll deal with those things again and investment planning. What happens a lot of times is people think that when they have a quote unquote financial advisor, that advisor addresses all these areas. Or when they have a CPA or tax person, that person essentially addresses all these areas. And my friends, I will tell you that you need a team. That is what differentiates the people who are getting it right from those who are just winging it. Uh, one of the panelists that we had some time ago talked about the difference between those playing in the major leagues from those playing in the minor leagues. I will say this to you guys, doctors. And when I say guys, I'm talking about male, female. So please, I'll say this to you. You are in the major leagues and you need major league counsel. You need to surround yourselves with the right team. So today it's about tax planning. Go on to the next slide. Today is about tax planning. As you know, um, you've seen this 
pyramid also before. Cash flow, avoiding losses. Today, we're going to be dealing with taxes, harvesting taxes on a last minute basis. We have two of the top tax masters, as a matter of fact, the founder of Tax Masters Network on this call. He will talk about how we can separate tax preparation and compliance from tax planning. Green lights, red lights. I'll mm -hmm. leave it to Ed. The rest of the pyramid we will address as part of the curriculum as we go forward. Go on to the next slide, please. Mr. Taxmaster, Hubert McIntosh. Hubert is a certified taxmaster. And one of the things about the taxmaster program is you go through a certification. Hubert is a CPA. He's an enrolled agent. And again, he's a certified tax master. Now I'll tell you this, there are hundreds of thousands of CPAs and enrolled agents out there. There are fewer number of them who have taken that next step to be certified and go through this process. And Hubert is one of them. Hubert is a star of stars as a practitioner on our team, Hubert has saved clients millions of dollars in taxes to the benefit of the clients, to the benefit of their families, the loss to the IRS. Hubert is going to actually highlight a few cases uh, doing case studies on this presentation. Um, and then uh, we will have um, Ed, go on to the next slide. Ed is gonna lead off the presentation this afternoon. Uh, Ed has been tagged the funniest tax guy in America. And hopefully you'll find him not only funny, but instructive. I say instructive because Ed is the coach to the masters. He's the founder of the Tax Master Network. Ed is an attorney. He's authored a number of books. He's appeared on numerous, more than 500 television and radio shows and so on and so forth. He is speaking to the experts that you're leaning on. He is coaching educating. So it is an honor to have Ed on this call Thank to you. share perspective. Okay, my friend, you take it. Okay. Uh, Stanley, if you want to advance two slides, my goal today is to change the way you think about taxes. And that's possibly an ambitious goal, but it's a crucial goal because so many people just don't have the appropriate attitude towards the role taxes play in their life or the uh, necessary understanding of how taxes play in their life. So uh, a couple slides ago, and you talked about the, the different things that go into financial planning. Ultimately though, they all come down to two different buckets. There's financial offense, which is making more, and there's financial defense, which is making less. Financial offense, obviously more patients, more procedures, higher fees, higher reimbursements. That is really tough in today's economy. You've got all sorts of threats towards your income. The pandemic is obviously one, and the pandemic is accelerating existing trends in medical economics. Insurance companies are getting tighter. Reimbursements are getting tighter. Independent practices are getting bought up by bigger practices and by hospitals. You know, the American public thinks that doctors are rich, and some doctors do make a very nice income, but getting a medical degree is not an automatic ticket to riches and it's not the 
it's not always the, the wonderful income that people think it is. So financial offense is tough. Financial defense is spending less. And you've got all sorts of things that you spend money on, but taxes for many of you are the biggest single expense you have. So if you're going to look at financial defense, it makes sense to focus where, where the money is. You know, yeah, you can save 15% on your car insurance by switching to Geico, but what's that really going to do for you in the long run? So our focus here is on financial defense taxes along with the pandemic, medical economics, market volatility, uh, taxes are a pretty significant threat to your financial future. We need to tame those taxes. Uh, next slide, please. So if I asked you how the tax code works, you would probably use an unprintable word because the tax code is 2,700 pages of, of mostly gobbledygook. But there really is a logic to it if you look. The tax code is a series of red lights and green lights. The red lights are where you stop and pay tax. The green lights are where you go without paying tax. So if we can move to the next slide. Code section one gives us the table of tax brackets. That's a red light, stop and pay tax. For those of you who have self-employment income, code section 1401 outlaws, outlines the self-employment tax. That's a red light, stop and pay tax. Section 1411 is the net investment income tax. Again, it's a red light, stop and pay tax. But if we go to the next slide, we see that very quickly the tax code runs out of red lights and starts putting in the green lights. And these are the areas where you can go without paying tax. So a section 105B plan, a medical expense reimbursement plan, let, may let you write off your medical expenses and your family's medical expenses as a business deduction. Imagine being able to write off your kid's braces or your LASIK surgery as a business deduction. That's a green light. Code section 132 authorizes something called certain fringe benefits. And for uh, those of you who have swimming pools at home, if you qualify, I have five words for you. On-premises employee athletic facility. And I have clients who are deducting their swimming pool as an on-premises employee athletic facility under code section 132J4. And Susan, you have a swimming pool? You're nodding your head there. <laughs> Code section 170, charitable contributions, that's a green light. And most charitable contributions go straight to charity, but there are several categories of charitable contributions where you can keep strings on the money, either get the money back after a period of time or continue getting income from the gift that you make. That's a green light. Uh, for life insurance, uh, and he's going to be talking in, in February about life insurance, code section 7702 says you can take tax-free income from life insurance. That is a green light. So next slide, please. The real issue is what kind of advice are you getting from your tax advisor? Most CPAs and enrolled agents are trained to focus on the red lights. And most of them have a, a red light mindset. And that is important because blowing through the red lights is what gets you in trouble. But very few tax professionals have the specialized training or the mindset to go looking for the green lights. And that's really what planners like Hubert McIntosh and I do. And I've worked with Hubert for several years. I know if the IRS had a 10 most wanted list, of people who cost them a lot of money in taxes, they would have Hubert's picture on, on his wall with, a, with, a, with a, a target outlined over it. Because as he's gonna show you in, in his first example, uh, the, the folks at the IRS don't like the revenue loss that he creates. But, but that's because he doesn't just record the red lights. And you know what, most of your CPAs, what they do is they put numbers in boxes they record history that you give them. So I'm going to ask you a very easy question that will help you realize whether you're working with a red light CPA or a green light CPA. And that question is, when was the last time your CPA came to you and said, here's an idea that I think will save you money? If the answer is never, then you're working with a red light CPA. 
and you could probably benefit from tax planning, proactive tax planning. All right, let me outline how it works. Uh, we can move to the next slide. And as healthcare professionals, you will all appreciate the analogy that we use. The tax planning process works like going to the doctor. If something is wrong and you go to the doctor, typically three things are going to happen. There's a diagnosis. What's wrong? There's a prescription. And the, the doctor or the dentist is going to write a prescription. It's going to be in a horrible handwriting and nobody's going to be able to actually read it. But the doctor is going to write a prescription and that's what do you do to fix the problem. And then finally, somebody is going to fill that prescription. So in January, I had a horrible toothache. I went to the dentist. What was the problem? It was a cracked tooth. The prescription was have the tooth extracted and the oral surgeon filled that prescription by putting me under and extracting the tooth. Works the same way in, in tax planning. Uh, further medical analogy, there are some problems that are chronic and there are some problems that are acute. So my tooth was an acute problem. It was solved with one issue. My uh, high cholesterol is a chronic issue and I've just started taking Crestor. I'm terribly depressed to think that I'm old enough to need cholesterol medication. I'm 56 and I was not happy about that. But you now there are, there are, there are chronic, chronic tax needs and there are, there are acute tax needs. So next, uh, next slide. The way it works with us is it starts with a tax assessment and uh, we sit down and we look at the tax return and ask a series of questions to diagnose the missing green lights. Most people have perfectly competent CPAs. We don't find a lot of out and out mistakes but we do find green lights that are missed and that's a lot of fun. Then we write a prescription and we call that a tax blueprint. It is a written tax plan that tells you what to do. And then finally, we have something called the tax operating system that helps fill the prescription. And in most cases, you're going to work with your local CPA or enrolled agent to fill those prescriptions and a team of specialists which is headed up by folks like Enyi and Hubert are going to help with, with some of the more specialized implementation. But this process does not require that you disrupt your existing tax relationship with someone who knows you, someone who you know you like and you trust and someone who understands their business. So I'm not here to ask anybody to, uh, to uh, you know, move their accounting business to me. My goal is to help you write that blueprint and find somebody to fill the prescription with the green lights. So let's move to the next step, next slide. And I'm gonna talk about a common tax planning challenge and that is saving for retirement. Most of you are familiar with a whole alphabet soup of different retirement planning alternatives. There are IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, defined benefit plans, cash balance plans. We have something we call a sparkle pony retirement plan because it's so sparkly. It's just the sparkliest retirement plan ever. But most of them come down to one fundamental concept. Put money in the plan today, take a deduction for the money that goes into the plan, which saves you some money now, and then invest that money over your working career until you start taking the money out in retirement. Sometimes that is a very good tax planning move. Sometimes that is a terrible tax planning move and it can actually create a retirement time bomb. You can actually set yourself up to pay more tax on that money than less tax. So let's take a look, and the goal here isn't to make you an expert in retirement planning, but to illustrate the kind of questions you need to be asking and the kind of questions that, that red light CPAs don't ask. So let's move on to the next slide. There are three times in an investment life cycle when you can either pay tax or don't pay tax. The seed, the growth, and the harvest. So when you're putting money into an account and first choosing investments, that's the seed. 
And in most cases, you take the deduction now on the seed. Then in most cases, there is no tax on the growth. But at the end, when you harvest, you pull that money out. So you avoid tax on the seed going in and you pay tax on the harvest coming out. Well, does that make sense? Let's take a look at the next slide. Lots of different scenarios. If you buy stock in Apple, you get, a, uh, you get no deduction on the money going in, no deduction on the seed. You don't pay tax as the value of that Apple stock or that Tesla stock rises over time. When you sell that stock, you pay tax on your gain, but you do get a bit of a break. You pay at a lower capital gains tax rate. So the gains that you earn on your stock get a lower tax rate than the income you earn from your practice. Well, you can put that money, you can put money into a traditional IRA or a 401k or a defined benefit plan. You can buy that same Apple stock. And now you're getting a deduction for the money going in. That sounds pretty great, right? Must be even better to buy stock in a, in a, in a pension plan because I get to deduct the money coming in. Well, not necessarily. Because when you pull the money out, now you've got to pay the tax, but everything that comes out of a retirement plan is taxed as ordinary income. There's no capital gain. So you have just cut yourself off from a pretty significant benefit of owning stock in the first place. And looking at the faces in this presentation, most of you who have your cameras on are at a young enough age that the bulk of your retirement investing is going into stocks. Well, congratulations. If you're doing it in a qualified plan, you have just converted capital gains into ordinary income. You've lost the ability to get what's called a stepped up basis and avoid tax entirely. If you bequeath the stock to your heirs, you've lost the ability to peel off part of your holdings and give them to charity and get some special tax breaks for charity. That can be a big mistake. And so it depends on what kind of strategy you are, you are looking at. Uh, next slide, please. The real question is, when do you want to claim your savings? Do you want to claim your savings now on the seed, or do you want to take your savings later on the harvest? And that's the magic eight ball question. But a lot of red light CPAs aren't even asking that question. They look at minimizing your tax bill right now in this year. And that's terrific for this year. But as we know, you invest over an entire life cycle. You're investing for income that you may not need for 30 or 40 years. And if all you do is look at the current tax year, you are taking an acute solution to a chronic problem. And in many cases, it's like treating patients with leeches. You know, it might feel good up front, but in the long run, it's counterproductive and it can actually be destructive. So the conventional wisdom, let's go ahead and, and look at the next slide. There are a couple of things that affect whether now is the time to take the tax break or later. The first is how much income are you earning right now? So the conventional wisdom is in your highest income years, typically in your late 40s, 50s, and early 60s, you're earning more money than you ever will. You're in the highest tax bracket you'll ever be. So go ahead and put money away now to get the biggest tax deduction for it under the assumption that you'll be in a lower tax bracket later. Well, that assumption isn't always correct. A lot of high income physicians and probably several of you on this call will never not be in the top tax bracket. You're gonna be in the top US tax bracket for the rest of your lives. If that's the case, a qualified plan may not make sense, especially if you're making contributions on behalf of employees. If you're young and you're just starting your career, if you're just launching your practice uh, and, and you're in, in lower tax brackets, it's probably a mistake 
to do a tax deductible retirement plan contribution. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get out of school in your 20s, or if you're just starting in your early 30s. So that's the first issue. Second issue on the next slide is where are tax rates right now? So we recently saw Washington lower the top tax rate from 39.6% down to 37%. And that might make you think that 39.6% was a pretty high tax rate. That's not true. We're actually in a period of historically low tax rates. The income tax came in in 1913. The original top rate was 7%. Very quickly shot up to about 80% to pay for World War I. Came back down to a 25-24% rate. Went back up again in the Great Depression and hit 90% to pay off World War II and stayed in the 90% until JFK's administration came down to 70%, uh, finally got down to 50% under, under Reagan and, and 28%. But when you look at where tax rates have been in United States history, we're at a fairly low period. And guess what we've done this year? Well, we've just spent trillions of dollars in red ink for coronavirus relief. $3 trillion for the CARES Act. We're looking at another trillion dollars in coronavirus relief that Congress is hoping to pass this week. I've seen estimates that it's gonna be eight or $10 trillion in federal spending by the time it's all done. So ask yourself, which direction are tax rates gonna go? Are they gonna go down or are they going to go up? They're not going down, they're going up. So the, 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 the process here then is not just look for some year end last minute tips. The process is take a comprehensive, holistic look at your sources of income, the places where you're spending your income, your family goals, your retirement goals, your business goals, your, uh, your legacy, charitable legacy goals, and put together a holistic plan. And that's what the tax blueprint prescription is. So Stanley, if you want to uh, advance to the next slide. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the tax blueprint. If you're interested in it, you can contact us. But the goal is to prepare a written tax blueprint with comprehensive advice, not just how do we save tax in December of 2020, but how do we save tax over the next five, 10 years of your career? So it's got to be comprehensive and holistic. We offer step-by-step -step implementation instructions for the person who is doing that for you. And the process does involve ongoing review. You don't just go to the physician once. I go to my physician annually for a three-hour executive physical. It's ongoing review. And if you're interested in more information on the specific uh, process, the uh, webpage at Wealth Rx for Doctors, uh, ANPA, will give you more information there. So that is, uh, that is it for, for my formal presentation. I want to turn it over to the most wanted tax man in America, the IRS enemy of the year. And that is uh, Mr. Hubert McIntosh, the tax doctor. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. And thank you for AMPA. Thank you guys for allowing us to share some wisdom and insights to you. And this was structured so much. Here it is, I am a tax master and I'm listening to my founder and I'm just beaming, I'm just beaming. I tell you guys, this is one of his best presentation that he saved today just for you. So my goal is just to give you some examples, you know, of what Ed shared with you and his presentation, and it's so interesting that we are so in tune that he didn't see my examples before his presentation. And you're gonna see where the examples are in line with what Ed just shared with you. So here's a, here's a fellow doctor, case one study. Fellow doctor, doctor has a situation. He came in, we diagnosed his taxes. And the doctor is concerned. He says, my tax is going to be high. And I said, what else is happening? Why do you think it's going to be so high? He says, I have some capital gains that I think is going to hurt me. I am, I am making a 
big sale. And I think taxes are going to kill me. I says, Doc, and we get through, and we go through the details. That's what Ed spoke to you about with the assessment. So we go through the assessment. So here's what we came up with, with the tax savings goal. Recurring. If you see the recurring savings potential for this doctor who happened to be, this doctor was a orthopedic surgeon. Year after year, his recurring tax savings potential was going to be two. Is going to be two hundred and seventy-three thousand five ninety-eight recurring. That's year after year, but because of the capital gain that he was facing, if you look there, you see one-time savings potential. We saved him six hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars where he thought he was gonna to send to Washington. So the total first year saving for that doctor was 939,000, 939,000. And his savings continue because this was three years. Can we go to the next slide, please? So what do we look at? We show you some examples here because we take each situation and we look at each situation and we customize it. It's not like we select one thing for everybody. Everybody doesn't fit in it. So in this particular case, what we did, we moved an entity that he has to an S corporation. And with the S corporation there, we saved 56,000. The doctor had three children. We hire these children. We hired his children. He saved 13,000 there. The ones you see there where it says discuss is that there was not a number at that time, but we discuss with, with, with we discuss the potentials we have. We implement doctors. Here's number four. Many of you as doctors, I tell you, sometimes you're not looking at number four. Number four could change your life, your family, your community, because as doctors, one of the challenge you have is risk. Risk, because with malpractice, malpractice insurance, stuff like that, we're basically, I've told doctors that, did you know you could have your own insurance company? And they're amazed. But these are the things we go through. So this number seven, seven, if you look at that, 14 day home rental. A lot of times, and you hear Ed mentioned the swimming pool, and I saw Miss Doctor, she looked at it, which I saw her face when he mentioned the swimming pool. But these are the things happening because sometimes you think because you're in business or your doctor, your home, your home is very critical. You can have business meetings in your home and it's a write off. Number eight, number eight, if you look at that, this doctor was very receptive. He was in a 401k. He was in a 401k riding off 18,000. I says, doctor, you're wasting your time. You know, I said, it, you know, not maliciously, you know. And we set him up in a defined benefit plan. We saved him. He's saving 203,000 every year. Merv, Ed mentioned this, number nine, medical expense. Because as you know, you file your 1040, for you to get your medical deduction, it has to be 10% above your AGI. And for every doctor that I know, you're not, you're not gonna get it. You're not gonna get it. I've not seen a doctor, and pardon me if I misspeak, I have not seen a doctor gets into residence, out of residency, making less than 200,000. So if you look at that, your medical expense has to be higher than 20,000. So you're spending 20,000 and it's just gone. We are proposing to you that if you're spending 19,000, all of that 19,000 can be written off. You know, next slide, please. So you see the, all right, so what we did there, number 10, Ed mentioned it, Ed spoke about it, because sometimes it's a, what we also help you with is changing the mindset, because sometimes when someone hears 
charity. And they hear charitable lead trust. They hear different charity. What it is saying, what the government allows you to do, you are giving and you're getting back. So you, I know the conception, there's a misconception sometimes with charity is that I am giving, but I'm not getting anything. It depends. You have some charity like that, but as we assess the situation, that's what we go through. But there are great, great opportunities for you. Next slide. So here it is now. So this is not a doctor, but why are we showing you different examples? Because we're showing you, we're using the tax code. We're not using the profession and to say, well, this is just allowable to doctors. And you're saying, well, we're doing a doctor presentation. Why are we showing others? Here's why, here's why. We have an ulterior motive. I'm going to tell you straight. Because as doctors, you have people in your life. You're going to your ear stylist. What happened to that ear stylist come in and you're treating her or him for something? And they're complaining because sometimes people come to the doctor. They're not just talking about their medical problem. They're talking about other problems too. So you have an opportunity where this ear stylist and, and imagine, imagine what you're going to get from this patient. This patient is going to become a raving fan because they're saying, my doctor is even talking to me about finance. How exciting is that? Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so this, so this ear stylist, we saved 77000 77,000, and this is recurring, recurring. So here's the difference. Number six there, 35,000 in a defined benefit plan. Number four, oh my gosh, there are opportunities some of you don't have. Accelerated property depreciation. What does that mean? The, as Ed talk about, you told me a red light CPA talk to you about accelerated because here's the truth of the matter. In CPA school, we didn't learn about accelerated depreciation. We heard about depreciation, straight line depreciation. Accelerated? Accelerated is where you have to go into some special studies and you're going into cost segregation. Deep, very detailed, but I'm just sharing with you the different opportunities. Next slide. Here's another one. So we all use a property management, property management company. Most of us, most of us are dealing with property managers. Whether we own a property and the property and we're renting it, we're dealing with a property manager. Whether we rent, whether we rent a condo or apartment, we're dealing with property manager. So here's a difference as a doctor. So we put this here because doctors, you are one of our centers of influence because you, you, you know, in that sense, we come to you, you write a prescription. We don't even question the prescription. We take the prescription and we just choose where we're gonna, where we're gonna fill it. As Ed mentioned, we can't even read what you write on the prescription, but because of the trust, because of the trust we develop in you, doctor, you write that prescription, we take it and we get it filled. So what we're showing you, just like you are medical doctors and that trust as tax professionals, we are encouraging you and showing you that there are people out there that they can be your financial doctor. I love any what any as wealth RX for doctors. So doctors, just the same way you have to look at it that there are financial doctors. Yes, we don't save physical lives, you know, we, we don't save physical lives, but I tell you, with what we're seeing in now, especially in the pandemic, it's scary when I see suicide. Suicide as in because people are stressed and some of it is financial stress. So mm -hmm. what we're hoping that those chronic, that we can change those chronic situation and make them acute. Next slide. So this property manager is just showing you again, 
This one was elected to be an S corporation. We say 14,000 here. Number six, defined benefit plan. Seven is the MERP. Ah, number eight. Oh my gosh, doctors. Here's what's happening with number eight. The regular, the regular CPA, the red light, the red light CPA, he's going to tell you, well, oh, get an HSA, get an HSA, and which is good, which is good. But if you can write up $3,000 in an HSA, what's your tax savings? Do the math, 20% of 3,000. But we have things that we can introduce you. Tax code. 401H, if I was able to do a survey, I would ask you, how many of you on this call have heard about a 401H? And I would bet 90% have not. So listen how interesting it is. Everybody heard about a 401K. Let's check the letters. H, you, you, you check where H is from K. We, you have to get to H before K. How do people hear about K, but they didn't hear about H? These are the hidden, these are the hidden green lights that has not been communicated to you. So we just hope that we share some insights with you so you can see that there are opportunities for you. You can go to the next slide and I think I'll turn it over back to Eni. Thank you Thank guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hubert. Now we've got the funniest tax guy in America <laughs> and the most wanted tax man in America. You know why now. We're mm -hmm. going to open it up for questions, my friends. Uh, Stanley? Well, um, thank you very much, Ed and Hubert. Um, AMPA membership, um, feel free to ask questions in the open mic. If you don't want to ask, you can um, put your questions on the chat. I'll ask for you without mentioning your name. Or you can, whatever, you can ask Susan, send it to Susan or send it to me. Uh, so, um, Hubert, can you elaborate on the 401H? I never heard of that. <laughs> I I, Christmas, he knew you but, hadn't. He knew you had never heard of it. It's the, it's, it's the first thing they teach us in law school. Don't ask a question if you don't already know the answer. Know the answer. When, when, when I ask somebody, when was the last time your tax guy came to you and said, here's an idea that, that I'll save you money? I know the answer is never. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. That Please. is such a great, I'm glad you asked. I purposely didn't explain further because I was hoping someone would ask. And I led up to it with the HSA. Think of an HSA. HSA, you can, you can um, for an individual, you can write off about 3,500. And for family, you can write off about 6,700. 401H is an HSA on steroids. Yep. You can write off 10 times what you write off in an HSA, but one condition, you have to have a business. You have to have a business where we establish, it can be an independent business, but you have a business. A, a person with just a straight W-2 does not have that ability. The 401H is part of a cash balance plan. Yep. And what a properly structured cash balance plan you know what we call that? We call it a super 401k because yep. it's a 401k on steroids. And a little bit of history on that, it did not to leave you hanging. 401k came about in 1978. And it came with a bias. The bias to the 401k was for employees. So, so a business owner did not get much benefit because he or she could just write off the same amount as the employee. But in 2006, the tax world changed. And most people don't even know that this tax code came about. It's called the Pension Protection Act, where it says 
wow, employers are not getting any benefit. We are going to modify the 401k rules and some of the IRA rules, and we call it the Pension Protection Act. So Dr. Stanley, thank you for asking that question. Thank Let you. me add this if I could. Um, I don't know if that question came from Stanley because if it did, it actually says to me that Stanley, you don't read, read your weekly bulletins that come from wealthirex.com because uh, a few months ago, we actually did talk about well, uh, talk about uh, the four <laughs> So That's hopefully it me. I appreciate it. <laughs> I do read it. it um, there's a, a bunch of questions on the private app. One is, um, you guys have very good knowledge here. What is the, a lot of, of our members, I believe 30 to 40% of AMPA have um, private practices. C corporation versus S corporation. Can somebody I'll go ahead and uh, and take that. So there are there are four different ways that you can be taxed as a business. And by the way, LLC is not a tax classification, it's an entity. You can be taxed as a proprietorship, a partner in a partnership, an S corporation or a C corporation. With a proprietorship, which is single member LLC for most of you or or just not you know, practicing with an umbrella at all, you're going to pay income tax and self-employment tax on all of your income. With a partnership, you're going to pay income tax on all of your income and self-employment tax on all of your income. With a C corporation, you pay income tax and employment tax on all of your salary. The C corporation then pays corporate level income tax on its profit. And if it distributes that profit to you, you pay a dividend level tax on that profit. Finally, the S corporation lets you split the money you make into two pieces, salary and profit. You pay income tax and employment tax, FICA, on the salary portion, you pay income tax, but not employment tax on the distribution. So for that reason, the S corporation is typically the best vehicle for someone who is earning a significant income because you can eliminate the employment tax on much of the income. But as you get bigger, it may make sense to add an S corporate or add a C corporation to the mix because there are things you can do with a C corp that you can't do with an S corp. If you are a W-2 employee for most of your income and then you also have side income from studies or speaking or patient work on the side, locum work on the side, then, then sometimes the C corporation is the best entity. This is, this is why it has to be a holistic analysis. There's no such thing as best business entity. There's only best business entity for you. So that's where the holistic process comes in because everybody has different circumstances. And I've, I've worked with physicians, everything from, you know, 200,000 a year self-employed, a million and a half a year self-employed, or, you know, $400,000 salary and a hundred thousand dollars self-employment income. Lots of different ways to attack the tax efficiency of the income depending on the uh, on the the, uh, the circumstances and uh, Shinny is asking is it possible to choose not to distribute profits in a C corporation year after year absolutely that is an option and for a lot of physicians who are looking to invest in real estate or invest in more equipment for their business in many cases a C corporation banking some of the income is the best strategy to do that Again, it just depends on, on what your specific goals are. And there's a, another question in here as well. Are there specific tax strategies for W-2 physicians? Unfortunately, recently, most physicians are W-2. It is much harder to do planning for W-2 physicians. The, a business of your own is the best tax shelter left in America, even a side business. 
So as long as there is some self-employment income, we usually have the opportunity to do planning. There are fewer opportunities for W-2 physicians, but there are still opportunities. And the reason most of them come in retirement planning. So if you are a W-2 physician making $400,000 a year, your 401k contribution is the same $19,500 or $26,000 as anybody else. And if you're making $400,000 a year and you're socking away $19,500 a year, you're going to have to save a whole lot of years to replace that income you're not going to be able to do it strictly in your qualified plan. So you're gonna to need to find other places to create retirement income. There are plenty of planning opportunities using charitable vehicles, using insurance vehicles, using uh, Roth vehicles, lots of different strategies that we can look at to create some additional retirement savings. There was a, a follow-on question about dividend tax on the, the last question about the C corporation. I don't know if you see that. Yeah, dividends, dividends are taxed according to your tax bracket. However, qualified corporate dividends that come out of your C corporation, they're capped at 20%, regardless of what your other tax bracket is. So again, it's just a matter of interplay between the corporate tax rates and your pre and post tax dividend rates. It could also change if the Democrats win both of the Senate seats in Georgia and Biden gets to pass his tax plan, the corporate rate is likely to go from 21 to 28 percent. That may upend many of those strategies. And again, that gets, gets back to the point, and I'm going to repeat it over and over. Tax planning is a chronic challenge and changes in tax planning uh, t changes in the tax law work the same way, you know, if a, if a patient develops cancer or develops type 2 diabetes, that's going to change the health care, that's going to change the prescriptions uh, that you recommend for your, your particular client. It works the same way with taxes. Can um, somebody talk about um, the charitable lead trust? Oh, by the way, this, uh, we all of our webinars are recorded and to be on the AMPA um, YouTube page later on today. What is the difference between charitable lead trust and just ch ch a charitable contribution? So a charitable contribution goes straight to charity. Charity gets all of the use of the money immediately, and there are no financial strings that you keep. A charitable lead trust is a vehicle that lets you put money in trust. The tr the, the trust makes charitable contributions over a period of time. It might be 10 or 20 years, but if you structure it properly, two things happen. One, you get to deduct all of those years' contributions right now, so you can accelerate 10 or 20 years' worth of charitable deductions into a single year. That can be a great strategy for lowering income in a high tax year. It's a great way to do a Roth IRA conversion so that you don't get socked with taxes on the Roth IRA, the deduction from the charitable lead trust can offset the taxable income from the conversion. The second advantage of the charitable lead trust is at the end of the term, you get the money back. So you're basically giving the use of the money for a period of time, taking the tax deduction for all those years of deductions right now, growing the money and getting the money back tax-free. It's a real Swiss army knife of tax planning, and there are a lot of things that you can do with it, but there is no such thing as a charitableleadtrust.com website where you can go and download a charitable lead trust document with all of the uh, stuff that you need to do. Unfortunately, it is not that easy. There's no, there's no charitableleadtrustzoom.com that does it for you. Somebody said they, they have a red light <clears throat> CPA. Yes. So is this the best way to contact you guys? That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's the that's the way to go. And now, our goal is not for you to fire your CPA. We don't want to embarrass your CPA. We work with CPAs across the country all the time. Most of them understand that they simply don't have the specialized training. So an internist, Stanley, obviously doesn't have your training in plastic surgery. And CPAs understand that. They have specialties and, and areas as well. Our goal is to help your CPA do a better job for you. We're not interested in embarrassing them or making them look bad. 
Owe, I'm gonna have you ask your own question, okay? You've earned that. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, as an estate planning um, attorney and a real estate attorney, I doff my fedora every time to the tax guys because they make everything work work perfectly. So again, I doff my hat to, your, to you on your presentation today and um, for doing what you do. Um, I, 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 I try not to ask specific questions about uh, specific instruments or, or tax plays at seminars like this, but I, I, I would do it anyway again. I, I'll do, do it anyway now. Could you explain the benefits um, of using a private foundation in relations to real estate owned by a physician, investment real estate, or the practice building that's owned by the physician? Absolutely. So the, a strategy like this gives you two different advantages. One, it can lower your current tax burden. And two, it gives you more money to invest in something that's going to help you reach your goal. So I'm going to surprise you all by saying my goal here, Hubert's goal here, Eni's goal here, is not to minimize your tax bill. Our goal is to help you accomplish your financial goals with a minimum of interference from taxes which interfere with you accomplishing your goal. So let's say you want to include real estate as a part of your financial goal. A private foundation is a, it's a specialized form of a charitable trust. You don't get the money back the way you do with a charitable lead trust, but the private foundation gives you the greatest control over the assets. So if you give money to the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation, not only have you given up the use of the money, you've given up the control of the money. And whoever runs that foundation is going to be making the decision on the program and the investments and all of that kind of stuff. A private foundation gives you more control over your charitable dollar than any other vehicle. And by contributing into a private foundation and then buying real estate or investing in real estate through the private foundation, you get the investment dollar, but you also get to invest the tax savings. So you get control and you get additional leverage in accomplishing your financial goals. Finally, one, one further point. A lot of people will leave money to charity in their will, leave money to charity at their death. Once they're done using the money during their lifetime or because they, they want the charity to get the money. I have a client I'm working with in California He's selling a business for $150 million next year. He doesn't want his children to inherit $150 million. They might get a little spoiled. I think we've all met bratty kids who inherited too much money and got spoiled. So uh, he's going to be leaving the money to charity. A big part of the planning we're going to do is if you give the money to charity now under one of these vehicles like a trust or a foundation or a pooled income fund or something like that, there are ways that you can take an income tax deduction now for money that isn't going to go to charity until your death. Why wait until you die to complete the chair to make the charitable gift if you can make the charitable gift now, take a tax advantage now and complete it at your death. So the um, the uh, private foundation fits into that as well. And, and, and again, OE knows better than anyone. This is a customized planning. There is no template that you just download from an internet website and fill in the blanks. Let me add, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Ed. Let me also thank you, Owe, for asking that question. Owe, as um, some, if not most of you know, is a friend of AMPA. Uh, he's an attorney um, and he does estate planning and business transactions. OA is, uh, let me say this now, in January, our uh, presentation in January is going to be headlined by one of you, uh, Dr. Yele Aluko. 
Yele is, uh, Dr. Aluko is um, the chief medical officer for EY, Ernst & Young, and um, a former president of AMPA, as you may know. Alongside Yele would be other experts. At that event, uh, you would have an opportunity to ask questions of experts. Uh, Owe is going to be the estate planning and business transactions attorney. Owe does real estate work, estate planning work, and is going to bring his expertise to this forum in January. I just wanted to say that and um, say thank you, Owe, for um, you know being a part of what we're doing uh, alongside uh, all the other professionals that we have. But um, I'm going to turn it back to Stanley, and if there are more questions, we can certainly answer them. Um, is there any last minute word on, I, you didn't mention it about the PPP and the tax implication for this year. Hubert, you wanna take that? I have not done any PPP work with, uh, with clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, yeah, there are there 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 are still opportunities, even though you'll hear people say there are none. But and what happened is that it's not finalized. Um, Congress is still trying to work out some additional stuff to it. But PPP, what happens though, the paycheck part of it, and 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 the program has been lumped somewhere. A lot of things were called, and they just call it PPP. But it's like a generic term where someone will say Xerox copy. So the PPP itself was just the Paycheck Protection Program. That ended. The Paycheck Protection Program ended. But there are other opportunities opportunities that if there's a specific situation, we can address that. There was another one called idle loan. That was where a company could have gotten it. That one is also ended. But there is an opportunity that sometimes is considered on the PPP program, but it's not PPP. There is something that came under the CARES Act that a lot of people are not using it. NOL, businesses with net operating Brilliant. losses, where normally you could go back three years, what they open it is if a business has a loss, they can go back five years and harvest some of those loss. All right, let me share a creative idea to you. Here's a creative. And this for your medical profession. All right, here with this, we are in this pandemic. We don't know what's 2021 going to be. And when I say creative, here's this now. What if you anticipate that you may lose half a million dollars next year? Anticipate. The government allows you to make accrual for anticipated loss and the CARES Act has enhanced that. And I've had it where a person will say, but I don't know what the loss is, but it's an anticipated because, and it gets very deep. It gets very deep. If any of you have that concern, Put that question in and they will give you a detailed response. But it's for businesses that add loss and you can also create loss because you're anticipating your loss for 2021 because most doctors who are not W-2, their income has dropped. Their, in, their income has dropped. I've had doctors where I had to adjust the financial plan because they dropped they lost income of 40 percent because some of the elected surgeries have not been able to be performed because the hospital is so consumed with managing the COVID stuff and the elected surgeries have been minimized. You guys know this more than me. 
but these are some of the challenges. So for, for any of you with businesses where you have any concern with that, reach out to us and we'll give you a specific response to your situation. Hubert, thanks. thanks. Um, let me just add this to what Hubert was talking about. As some of you may know, uh, the issue around forgiveness of some of the loans is still totally unresolved. And so these are things that are still on the table. And I suspect that the question that was asked had may have some inference regarding uh, some of the forgiveness aspects of the loans that were given this past year. I am certain that uh, as these issues get Clearly, clearly resolve, uh, you're going to get your share of loan forgiveness. But also as Hubert just talked about, uh, there are other things additionally that you want to look at or contemplate with regard to reducing your tax burdens and things like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we have to um, keep it short. We promise Ampa we're going to keep it to about an hour. We are about 11 minutes over, but this is awesome information. Um, if you want or need more information, you can reach out to our, our amazing presenters at worldrxfordoctors.com slash Ampa. The phone number is listed at 513-769. 2700. I want to inform everyone that uh, AMPA webinar is an intentional aggregation of subject experts. They've given their time. This is something that we would normally pay for to get this kind of expert opinion, but they've volunteered their time because of our relationship. So we really, on behalf of um, AMPA, I don't know if Chris is still on, on board. I cannot speak for AMPA. I'm not the president. Stanley, <laughs> yeah, just, just something else. <laughs> thanks, everybody. And quite honestly, I big thank you to the panelists. I started by saying thank you to you. And every time I sit here to listen to your presentations, I must tell you, I learn a lot. And I would imagine that a lot of people who are on this call are also learning. And I would take advantage of my position and say, there's one question here, which I think is very pertinent that has not been asked by Stanley, which is what is the usual cost for your tax blueprint assessment? I think this is, I think I don't want to miss this out because whoever shared this question with us, you know, everybody on this call might also be interested. So uh, as I round up my conversation here, maybe somebody would take that as a last point before you, before we, you know, say goodbye. But sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. I was going to defer to you, Ed. Exactly. Go ahead. Because I'm the one who puts the tax blueprint together. So it, it depends, on, it depends on, on your income and how complicated your circumstances are. It's typically a four-figure amount somewhere in that range. And uh, four figures up to, up to the very lowest possible five figures. But we have a very strong guarantee with the tax blueprint. We guarantee that we will find at least your fee in first year savings. For the more expensive plans, we guarantee that we will find twice your fee in first year savings. So we've structured it. You're all used to, to paying a CPA or an EA to do taxes for you. That's not an unfamiliar transaction. This is an unfamiliar track unfamiliar transaction, so you may perceive some risk. So we will reverse the risk with our guarantee. And we're not asking you to say yes, we ask you to say maybe. You don't have to say a final yes until after you see the plan. And we structure it so it's like flipping a coin where heads you win, tails you don't lose. That's I would, that's I would, I would, I would say, really I would say this, Chris. Um, I, the, fan, the tax planning people that I've used is what every money I've paid them. I would say that. And um, if uh, um, so some of us who are in, in our businesses know the value of this kind of relationship. So, uh, because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, that's true. So right. that's yeah, we're in the blind spot business. 
So thanks, Ed, for taking up that question. I felt it was important that you know this question uh, get answered. So again, once on behalf of the organization, Association of Nigerian Physicians in the Americas, I want to thank any tank. Dr. Stanley Okoro, Dr. Ejionwe, and all members of the panelists, and the most wanted guy by the IRS, you know, Hubert <laughs> McIntosh. Please, please stay away from them. And, you know, this was a wonderful presentation, and thank you all. And to all members of AMPA who are on this call or on this presentation, I say thank you, and um, let's stay safe and remain blessed, and uh, all good week. have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been thank a real you pleasure. All. Thank you. Thank you, guys.